So uh, I actually run operations at uh, TripAdvisor. Um, I sort of went over to the dark side about three and a half years ago from software development to running operations. But I hope what you'll see as we go through this presentation is that we run operations just like it was any other software development team and sort of applying some of the things that we take for granted coming out of the software world. Um, so just very quickly on us, TripAdvisor, local company headquartered in uh, Newton, Massachusetts. Uh, this is where we, uh, we started out back in 2000. Um, I'm only with the company three and a half years, so I didn't actually get to work above a pizza store. Apparently some of the founding engineers can't eat pizza to this day. Uh, from a volume perspective, um, we actually do about 109, we have about 190 million reviews and opinions uh, stored in our site. We have about 315 million unique visitors every month. Um, so the other interesting thing about TripAdvisor is where our traffic uh, comes from. So 22% is from North America and 44% is, uh, is actually from Europe. And you can see another 22% from Asia Pacific. So a truly global site, travelers all over the world using the site, reviewing hotels, checking out, researching where they want to go uh, for vacations. Um, some more sort of nitty gritty infrastructure numbers. Um, we do somewhere between half a million and 1.5 million hits per minute. Now these are actual hits to our origin servers that require tens of thousands of lines of code to execute. I've pulled out all the fluff, you know, the, the static content and the images and all that sort of stuff that we've offloaded. So actually back, coming back to our data center for us to execute lots and lots of Java code. Uh, so we usually hit that 1.5 million hits around the summer is our, is our peak. Um, we have about um, a thousand production servers spread across multiple data centers, uh, all in the US. Um, and we deal with about two, point, two terabytes or so of compressed logs a day coming back from the site. Uh, that's sort of web logs, commerce logs, et cetera. We ship it all back to, to Massachusetts to crunch it. So again, not huge numbers compared to Facebook, but we're proud of them. And, and we manage it with just a team of 12 software engineers. Um, so we don't do the cloud. We use S3 for storage. We have our own infrastructure. Um, Amazon is very expensive when you, when you get to a certain scale. Um, and so uh, that's why we do everything as like software engineers. So we, we apply a lot of the, uh, the same principles of let's do it once and, and, uh, and script it and, and reuse it. So where does big data fit in? At, at Trip, we have about 10 terabytes of data in Postgres. So we're a Postgres shop, have been for a very long time. We use Hadoop heavily on the back end. We have about 2.5 petabytes of Hadoop data. We're pack rats, we don't like to delete anything. That user click stream from five years ago, we might find a way to analyze it, so let's keep it, right? Anyway, thankfully HDFS is cheap. Um, we have about 160 large nodes. By that I mean we like to buy, you know, decent sized servers with SATA disks, but you know, 14 of them, and you know, 64 or 128 gig of memory. So small number, but large capacity uh, Hadoop nodes. And as I said, we store about 280 terabytes of log data on site. Um, on the analytics side as well, we're using Redshift and Tableau more and more um, until the bill starts giving us nosebleeds. Um, Redshift is wonderful for sort of getting something up quick, you know, quick and dirty, and then you can do a lot of great sort of ad hoc querying of the data with it. Um, our product managers don't really like the Hive uh, CL or the CLI and Bash to do their analysis. And uh, we use uh, SAS and we have some static cubes as well for some of the uh, more static data that we're analyzing. So what about operations? So when I was putting this deck together, uh, and, you know, I've been running operations now for several years and we've been managing Hadoop clusters and providing all this functionality to our business uh, teams for a very long time. And in operations, we weren't applying any of these principles or any of these techniques to actually running our production environment. Um, if you look at sort of typical operations tools, it's, they're horrible. Um, I'm gonna knock cacti an awful lot here. If you love cacti, I'm sorry. I'll buy you a drink later, but man, it, it just doesn't scale with, you know, as you add more and more servers. Um, the, I, the metrics that you can use with traditional operations tools are tiny. So again, a, a, you know, take Cacti, take a thousand servers. The typical server, you're looking at about 30 metrics off it. You know, straight away you're into 30,000 graphs. And the data, you have to go look and interpret the data. The data is not going to tell you, hey, something's wrong, something's trending badly. You have to go look at it. Um, and of course, things like aggregation is a hack. And, and here we are building all these state-of-the-art, you know, Hadoop and Redshift and all these different analytics tools. We're looking at our click stream for it and we're using sort of 1990s tech to actually manage the site and keep our uptime. And uh, four nines is not an easy number to achieve. Um, so, you know, we had to make some changes. Um, the best example is we release um, nine times a week 
Um, we do one release on Monday, although we're moving to two, and then we do two releases every other day. And these are large you know, releases. We're rolling a release through the site. We're pushing out maybe 50 or 100 projects uh, on that Monday release and maybe 30 or 40 projects in every other one. So continuous development, pushing code out every single day. So imagine this process when you're using outdated operations tools like Cacti. So let me take you through the, the workflow for the release engineer. So start off the release, cut the branch, start running the scripts, it's all automated, kicking it off, starting to push the code to two or 300 servers. Monitor 30,000 cacti, yeah, that's not happening, right? <laughs> Monitor your email, listen for people shouting, uh, watch all the other monitoring that you might have in place, and you know, hope that you might, you, know, you catch something because you know every change that's going out in that release, so you know the services that you should be watching. And then finally, the most important step of the process is you pray <laughs> that it works just fine and your day's not ruined. Remember, we're doing this on the live data center, and if it goes wrong, it goes horribly wrong, and we, we end up down. So again, current tools not you know, designed for this. Now, um, I know in the software development world, we talk a lot about continuous delivery, continuous deployment, lots, lots of unit tests, lots of integration tests, et cetera. They're great. That helps a lot. We write a lot of unit tests. But that's not enough, right? When you're pushing out to a site where you know literally you're, you're, you could be you know zero revenue for like an extended period of time if you get it wrong, you know you don't want to be taking chances. You want to be monitoring at every level, including how that code not just functions because the unit tests pass, but how it actually operates, what CPU it uses, what memory it uses, etc. And if something goes wrong with that, then you can jump on it and roll it back as quickly as possible. So these tools weren't cutting at first. The other thing I want to mention is. We were using principal level software engineers as release engineers because of the fact that we didn't have any sort of additional metrics and data to tell us, hey, something's wrong, roll it back. So we had some of our best engineers spending three hours doing a release. Uh, so what was the solution? Well, um, we needed to move to some more flexible technology, so measure everything. So we, we literally took that, this is, um, this is actually on the door of our CEO. He has it written along with speed wins, which is kind of the TripAdvisor mantra, which is equivalent to lean, the amenable viable product. He also has, if it's worth doing, it's worth measuring. And operations was not really following this mantra too well. Um, so we went from you know uh, about 30 metrics per server to about 580 system level metrics, including you know, GC cycles, uh, the JVM metrics, the various different, I think I've got like 20 CPU, uh, 20, you know, 10 metrics per core uh, that are reported as well. So we just went to a ton of metrics, and we threw the actual web logs in for good measure so we could look at time to last bytes and, and so on. So we went to about 700,000 per second that we were actually looking at. Um, we also wanted to interpret the data more frequently, so we, we wanted it, currently we we're interpreting it every 10 to 15 minutes. So if something goes wrong, we'll know about it within 10 to 15 minutes. I'm not psyched about that, but we wanted to start off slow. I'd like to get that down to a, in a couple of minutes if I could. Uh, but you do need to look at data and sample it for a while to know whether something's gone crazy or not, especially at volumes. And then we start, we, obviously we're tuning at the moment. We want to be able to weed out false positives. I want, when, when we're running this new process, when we're running anomaly detection or queries against live metrics coming back, I, I have to make sure that I tune it properly so that I'm not getting you know, pager fatigue. So you can't really start alerting and waking somebody up or rolling back a release or having somebody look at it you know, uh, unless they trust the data. So tuning is an important part of this process. So what did we do? Well, um, we didn't use VoltDB. We took a whole pile of stuff. <laughs> so um, we had some existing tech. I mean, I didn't want to go ripping out everything we already had, so we're kind of leveraging. Uh, obviously, the core is CollectD. I don't know if any of you guys have worked with CollectD. It's an awesome framework for gathering unbelievable amount of metrics off a server. There's lots of plugins for Postgres and all sorts of systems out there. Uh, we had Scribe, which won the log shipping war, or lost the log shipping wars to Flume, but we have it at the moment. We're probably going to be kicking that over to Kafka in the next couple of months. Again, no, no Volt DB, sorry. Um, and we ship that to some central log servers at our data center, and then we ship it back to Newton, where we actually load it into Graphite and Postgres. So we're a big Postgres shop. We looked at what we needed. We said, you know, we don't need streaming right now. Let's just see if this works. So we use Postgres. Uh, we also dropped the data into Graphite because Postgres doesn't do too well on time series data and charting. It was doing, ended up doing a full table scan on us. So we ended up using Graphite for, for graphing all of this. So very simple solution, right? Open source tools, just you know, MacGyver together with paper clips and, and so on and uh, you know, pulled. And so, you know, what, so why do we use Postgres? Um, 
mostly because we knew it really well and we knew we could make it run at this level. We really wanted anomaly detection. So this is literally a process of running reports over the data that's coming in. There are large SQL uh, requests. They're fairly gnarly in some cases. But Postgres ran really well at it. We were able to do about, you know, we've got about two terabytes of data in that Postgres database now. So it's not our biggest Postgres database. We have about 90 days of aggregate. And you know this is going up. I, I know I don't have a lot of runway in Postgres. I know probably in about a year I'm going to be probably rolling out some stream-based solution uh, to replace it. But for the last six to 12 months, it's been great. And again, it's sort of keep it simple, right, to start off. But we had to prove that this would actually change how we worked operationally first before actually sort of over-engineering it. So, so and I'll, I've mentioned anomaly detection a couple of big times. So the, uh, a couple of times. So. So the reason why anomaly detection, is I wanted that data to work for us. I didn't want us to be looking at, now instead of 30,000 graphs, I've gotten you know, fi you know, 500,000 inside in Graphite that I'm not going to be looking at. I wanted to actually run some processes on that data and actually alert our engineers to when there were issues. And so our anomaly detection is very simple, sort of capture what's happening now, compare it against data from a day ago. If you're doing a release, we're going to release first to a couple of small pools of servers. So of our fleet of 160 web servers, um, I'm going to push that code out to maybe eight of them and, and monitor it for you know, 30 to 40 minutes and see how it goes. So I'm going to compare how those pools are doing relevant to the, uh, relative to the other pools. And this is everything from CPU, memory, commerce. Uh, you know, how is it doing in terms of converting users? Because it's just as bad if the actual the new code goes out and you know, the, the buy button or the, sh the book it button is gone and like, sort of now all of a sudden you're not doing any commerce. That's probably <laughs> that's a lot worse. So we, need, we use commerce as a key, a key metric for whether the site's doing well. And there's a whole host of others. Um, you know, I'm, my team is worried predominantly about um, CPU load, memory pressure, et cetera, because you push the wrong release out there with some, some uh, poorly optimized code and you know, all of a sudden our capacity could all be gone and, uh, and we, could be, we, could be, uh, we could go down. So again, we also look at statistical, you know, look at historical variance over the last nine days. And we track for statistical changes. So sort of this is um, typically, you know, is a two or three times standard deviation change compared to what it saw before, and then typically alert. Now this is where the, it gets a little sort of uh, more complicated for us. The engineers have to tune these reports and these anomalies all the time, depending on the different metric. Because again, you don't want pager fatigue. You don't want these things going off all the time. And it's taken us a while before we can take a new anomaly report and actually make it, you know, get it to the page. Uh, we want to make sure that it actually is, is, is working properly. Here's a good example of one. This is, a, again, an, a graph by engineers for engineers. Um, and so what, you, what, I'm, what I'm pointing out here is uh, when we were running a release, actually, we pushed out some code. This is time to last byte from probably the most important page on our website, the hotel review page. And you know, I know it doesn't look like an awful lot, but that was enough to roll back a release. We saw a change in the time to last byte. Um, we know that users are impatient. They don't like slow pages, and we changed. The page took longer to render, and so we didn't like what we saw, and we, we actually rolled that release back. Got the engineers involved. They fixed the issue, and we rolled it out that, that afternoon. And so as you can see here, we're looking at sort of various different percentiles. That's actually a heat, gra a heat map, too, of, of the, uh, the various hits and where they land. So okay, so now we've built this infrastructure, we have it in place, what does release day two look like? So again, we deploy the new code to two pools on our, on our live site. We monitor the key metrics and we actually allow the system to monitor them through the anomaly detection. So we pretty much let the code soak on those pools for about 30 to 40 minutes so we get decent amount of data. Again, running those tests and at, the, at this stage, the release engineer is kicking things off in Jenkins and going about their business doing some other work. They're no longer monitoring all the charts. They're no longer looking at tons of graphs. And they're no longer looking at certain email folders where the error reports come in. They're waiting for these tests to run and for them to report to them, hey, how are you doing or, or not? And then based on the results of those tests, and if they're not being paged, et cetera, they'll make a decision to either roll back uh, or roll it out to the entire site. Now, this was a cultural change within our release engineering team. We had, again, principal level Java engineers, great engineers, and they would, rather than roll a release back, they would go through some heroic effort for the next two to three hours, and man, they'd get that code to stick. They'd find the problem, they'd get it patched, and they would roll it out. And so if we're going to do multiple releases a day, that had to change. We had to start rolling back, sending it back to the engineering teams so that they knew what, knew to, uh, you know, what to look for and, and to do better next time. So thankfully, there was no, more need, no need for praying anymore, or at least it was reduced. 
So what are the results? Um, well, we roll back on average uh, one release per week for various reasons. Sometimes it's commerce, sometimes it's code efficiency. Um, you know, it's, a lot of times it's the commerce ones that we watch. Um, you know, the release engineer spends about 15 minutes doing a release instead of formally three hours. Um, so we've had a dramatic reduction in user facing issues from this because now we know and we're, very, we're much more aggressive about rolling back code that we don't, you know, we worry that it doesn't look right. Um, and of course, uh, uh, for our success, we, are, we have to do more releases every day. So we're trying to f fit them in. We, we don't, again, we don't do that sort of, you know, um, net, you know with the, I guess one of the values of being on the cloud is you can do that sort of roll it out in the background and then sort of, you know, um, make, you know push traffic off to it if you've got twice the infrastructure. Uh, we have to do rolling releases across our, our farm, so it takes a few hours to push out to all of those servers. So there'll be a limit to what we can do, but I'm in, I have members of my team in Palo Alto now, I have members of my team in Dublin, so we get a lot of coverage during the day, so I'm sure we'll start to do a lot more releases. And like I said, strict policy on rolling back. Um, so I kind of expect people to ask, so, so like why not, why, why aren't you using Hadoop? Well, Honestly, I'm already unhappy that I'm waiting five to 15 minutes for the data to come back from the anomaly detection. And I, at the time, I didn't want to introduce uh, the additional latency of Hadoop. I love Hadoop. Like I said, we have a, we have a large Hadoop cluster, but we were able to do this in, in, in Postgres. We were able to get the results quickly. And so we, we, went, we didn't want to go with the MapReduce model. I am looking at the streaming model now because I know, as I said earlier, we don't have a lot of, a lot of uh, runway with, with Postgres. And uh, so, you know, projects like Phoenix and so on as well. Um, so that sort of addresses that. So what's next? Um, uh, we're just going to continue to expand our set of metrics. Um, most of that 700,000 a second right now is actually our, our um, web logs coming back from the, from the site. And that sort of goes up and down, especially when teams are doing load testing in our backup data center. We routinely spike up to a couple of million. Um, reducing the false positives. Unfortunately, it's like a moving target, right? So you're, as your application developers change your code, they change the behavior of the site, you gotta tune the actual anomaly reports over and over again. But it's okay, it's not very complicated right now, and so we can, we can keep up. Um, add more that we alert on rather than just sort of notify. Um, so we're engineers, we, you know, you saw what we're using as graphs, et cetera, but now the management wants to see more of these metrics, and uh, so we'll probably have to visualize and put some dashboards to, uh, together. And uh, also, we haven't really started correlating the data, right? So, you know, what's, you know, when an event happens here, what other system metrics are changing, what, what application metrics are changing? Um, there used to be a time when our engineers knew every single system, subcomponent, service, et cetera, and they already, they, it sort of, you know, uh, they already knew, okay, well, if that's happening, it's probably these four things. But as we get bigger, the, that sort of information is getting dispersed among the 250 or so software engineers we had. We need the systems to start highlighting potential, you know, okay, well, if this is happening over here, it could, it's, and we're seeing time to last byte on these pages go up, there's correlation between them. So, all right, that's my presentation. So, uh, thank you. Right. So I have a, a couple of minutes, if anyone has any questions. Yes, question down here. Are there ever any problems with rolling back? Um, so, uh, yeah, there can be, depending on the change set. Um, if someone has, if, you know, objects, et cetera, being pushed out onto our CDN, that can be, you know, we have some procedures now in place that we've built out around it. So, you know, when we started on this, getting to being able to roll back easily was actually a major piece of the development as well. So, yeah, there was, and we, we put a lot of engineering into versioning around static content and images and so on so that we could roll back. You know, seamlessly. So now, no, but at the start, yeah. Question back here. So when we roll out, do we roll out to, to the one geo? So um, no, we actually roll out to the same pool of servers. So we have these two small pools, and there's a sample, a percentage of users from all over the world that are in that pool. And uh, again, we run our site out of two US-based data centers. So yeah, so it's, it's, it's on the servers. Uh, I think there was one more over here. Yep. So, um, why isn't more of the anomalies in Hadoop? Why aren't most anomalies caught by one zero to begin with? Automation and, and things like that that are built into the data center. Right. So, um, why aren't more of these anomalies uh, caught by the engineers rather than than us? Um, so, there's a couple of reasons for that. Typically, um, you know, functional functional bugs, etc., they catch. 
Um, this is much, these are typically much more on the, you know, it's a combination of how their new code interacts with, say, other back-end systems that, where they didn't see it or didn't think of it when they were coding it and writing their, their tests. Or maybe they didn't throw traffic patterns at it, like, you know, the hundreds of thousands of hits per second, and, you know, the CPU load was higher than what they observed in, a, in our test environment. Um, it's, it's really ranged. Um, or, you know, maybe they didn't realize that, and this is where it gets into A-B testing if you've, done it, if you've done it in the past, where, you know, damp, you know, that green colored button was better for converting users than the red colored button. I mean, it, it, it runs the gamut, you know, and it's not until they get, actually get it out into live site that sometimes they find these things. Yep. Yep. And, uh, yeah, I think I'm out of time. All right, thank you.